Before I focus in on the particular subject, I think it's important to give um, an overview of the context of beings that are associated with us in this particular world at this particular time, apart from the human beings, of course, and the different <coughs> places and stages at which they are at. Obviously, we've got human beings of all different ages, both in the physical state and in the non-physical condition, descending and ascending out of incarnation, crossing over, meeting each other in various worlds. There's also, in the very highest world, there are beings that never descend into the physical world. They are the creators of the foundation of the archetypes of embodiment of this particular cycle. And there are many different kinds of beings. <clears throat> then there are the elemental beings of nature, the, the beings that are hidden behind the forces and manifestations of nature, which modern science is blind about, doesn't see, for all sorts of reasons, we'll explain why that is. And then there are four other great super-sensible beings that are very entangled with our evolution, are deeply involved with the development of the human being. <clears throat> Obviously, one is the solar logos. Christians call the Christ, has been named many, many things throughout evolution and was in a long descent through all cultures and is named differently in the Egyptian, in the Babylonian, in the ancient Indian. But it's essentially the same being who is the archetype, the template for the eternal humanity, which we are, we are on the threshold of actually experiencing the eternal humanity. This is the true final frontier. It's not outer space. The final frontier is really the awakening and the perception of across the threshold of the so-called dead that are not dead. And that's, that would be, that is coming more and more and more to humanity. Children are being born who remember previous lives <clears throat> and people will be able to see across the threshold those who have left the physical plane and follow them in various processes. That's going to happen. Okay, apart from the solar logos, in a sense the most vital being at the centre of human evolution, we'll go into that as well, there is of course um, the two main adversarial beings, beings that are opposing the human being in evolution. However, with the right orientation to these beings, we will be that much richer and that much greater for them having opposed us than if they never did in the first place. So actually they are necessary, but we have to have the right relationship to them. <clears throat> and they are, as Steiner has indicated, I mean they can be called many things. One is the being of Lucifer, the being who fell from heaven, who is, um, has brought about, in a sense, the world of organism, the world of separated organs and organ systems hidden in physical bodies, where we have this sense of physical separation from others, and also what that being brought about through various stages of its evolution is a falling away from what I call the vertical consciousness of the human being to the higher worlds in ancient times, which is rather like a plant opens and closes to the sun. This was an ancient state of consciousness. There wasn't individual thinking, there wasn't even a sense of true individuality, but there was a deep relationship to the creator being. <clears throat> this then fell into the horizontal, which is really, in a sense, the animal, the astral, where the desire and the intention and the attraction moved away from the gods into other <coughs> beings and things on the earth plane. This is a whole, and this is also connected with the actual shaping of what we call the physical world, the horizontality of the physical world. And, this, and all, with all that came also the realm of what we call death. Because as being separated, their consciousness, uh, which at that was also united with life forces, they only had a certain quotient of time of forces within them so they could maintain because they cut themselves off from the source. So they had to die to reconnect. They had to leave the physical body. And that, that was the time when the physical world experienced for the first time corpses, corpses of plants, animals, human beings. And that was, and this was what I would call the realm, I could call the realm of thingness, when things appear 
Before that, it was all beingness. There was no thing that was separate. There was no death principle. But that death principle of objects lying around, like for instance, I've said this before, when a plant dies or a tree dies, a branch is left, wood remains for a long time. In the ancient times and in other dimensions, that is not the case. When a thing, then the life leaves it, so the actual form disappears simultaneously. But there is a delay now between the life leaving something and the form remaining. That will change also. <clears throat> now, that this descent from into organism, which has to do with separation, all these are two tremendous separations necessary for the development of the individual. We couldn't have had individuality, our true nature. But of course, with that comes competition becomes the, the battle for resources, becomes in the animal, the seeing of energy in one kind of animal that's not in another, makes that animal want to eat the other one, it's to get back to the oneness, to the communion. So all these fallen activities are images of a much higher desire. <clears throat> so that's the first fall, you could say, was the fall into organism. Then comes the fall into mechanism, which is a deeper fall, and that is what we're in now. We're, and the de we haven't completely fallen into it, but we could if another being, Steiner indicates this being Ariman, who is the um, Persian god of darkness, originally named by um, Zoroaster. Ariman has extracted from the interior mysteries of organism principles that are reappear as mechanisms and technology. It's a whole history of Ariman's biography. That's a big thing in itself, what, how that would work. But to come back to the whole Luciferic thing, one can say that the Aramanic beings create a desert. They deny the soul. You can hear it in scientists, many of them, not all of them, but here's scientists who deny. They, you know, they, it pops out of their brain. There's no such thing as the afterlife. There's Stephen Hawking, Dawkins, so there's no such thing as a soul. We're just molecular machines. This is just Araman's thoughts. The paradox is that Araman knows that he's not true. He, he's, he's a spiritual being, but he's putting into the human being the idea that there isn't such a thing. And, be, and because if people take that up, then it works into schools, it works into education, it works into all areas of society, and creates a kind of desert, a real desert, in which an incredible thirst is, is generated in human beings. They're not even aware of it. And they will then drink from anything because of the thirst that Ariman has created. <clears throat> That's where the Luciferic forces come in, because they offer the oases, the places where people can drink. So they, they rush towards this and they drink undiscriminatedly on, from various uh, sources, which are many of them mirage, they're not real, uh, or the oasis is poisoned. And that's where we come to the, you could say, the Luciferic aspect of the New Age. Not all the New Age is Luciferic, there's some very genuine, great things in the New Age, but there are some things which are they are, they're not the true, the true being of Lucifer is not working in them. It's a residual activity of the Luciferic, which is to go back into earlier stages of consciousness. I mean, <clears throat> if you look at the yoga, system of yoga, which is a great part of one of the great teachings of the ancient Indians, there's Vedas, which is about the coming into being of worlds. Then there's the Sankhya, which is the coming into being of the human being, descending from the, the Jacob's Ladder, so ties in with the Kabbalah as well. And then there is a yoga, which is about the, the desire to reconnect, to reunite with the divine source. But a lot of yoga was in the past turned back to the past, looking back at the origins of the world and the, particularly the Atlantean and pre-Atlantean consciousness to unite with that. Now it can be turned the other way towards the communion of the future. You could say we once were in a union completely dependent union, then we fell into independent disunity, which is what we're somewhat experiencing now. We all of us struggle towards communion because it lives in our soul, because we've known it out of the body. But there are all these forces in us which are constantly making us compete and you know, f make enemies out of everything that's not ourselves. This is the great archetype of the, you could say, the antichrist archetype that lives in all of us, as well as the Christ principle, which is me first, I'm the number one, I'm more important than anyone else. To, you know, I know my body, I feel my feelings, no one else does. You know, that's, that's something we are working with, dealing with. But 
the Luciferic forces want to, um, they look at the Aramanic desert and they say, don't worry about it, just anesthetize yourself, go back into the womb, feel this wonderful thing. Um, it's like an opium, it's an opiate that these beings are offering. Because they're not, what they're doing is they're putting to sleep the one faculty that can transform and turn us from the, what I call the independent disunity into the in, interdependent communion of the future. Because first of all, we have to be individuals. We have to be really strong, like in an orchestra. We have to learn our instrument perfectly before we can play with the rest of the orchestra. When we know how to play our instrument really well, then we can immerse ourselves in the orchestra and not lose our own sound, but actually add to the sound of the whole orchestra. And our individual sound becomes even more individual, paradoxically, through working with others. And that's the stage we're at now, because this stage of truly valuing and seeing the worth of everybody that we meet, if we can, it's not easy. All the time there are forces that are wanting to negate that, but to, to look at, to try and remember that we, we cannot in any way measure the infinite potential of, the, of human beings. We don't know what their destiny is. We don't know what possibilities exist within. And all of, all of us have something which is working and developing. This is this whole thing about name and number. We have our name in the physical world given by our parents. And that's the middle realm, you could say, the, what we call philia, the interaction of feeling realm. <clears throat> and then you have the, the, the name that is the eternal name, which is what we're moving towards, which is, re reveals the motif that is developing through all our lifetimes, that is developing into a unique capacity, unique ability. This is the concept of the eternal soul. This is the salvation.